Hello everybody, John Nelms here. I wanted to share a, just a few minutes with you, if that's possible for me, about our, a recap of our recent trip to Pakistan. I had been trying to get to Pakistan for about three years because we've been helping a brother over there and I wanted to meet him personally. This brother was referred to me by a dear, dear friend, Eddie Wilson of Christian Media International. And every time I made a trip to go to Pakistan, something came up to stop it. So last November, when the third trip was canceled, I committed that I would go in February of this year and that the only thing I would let stop me would either be death or um, the rapture. And so we went and with me was our videographer, Joshua Martin. Uh, I wanted him to go along and see what I was gonna see so that he could, I can talk to you about it, but he can show you about it. In fact, shortly after this video goes out, within a few days probably, I'm guessing, He's going to be having another uh, video of what we saw in Pakistan, the beautiful scenery, the tribal people. Also with me was um, Roy Harris. I've known Roy for probably 15 years. Uh, he was a member of the church that I attend, and we're good friends. Roy has the hope of someday after he retires being able to work with Final Frontiers. And frankly, now after seeing him in action, our doors are wide open more than they ever were before. But Roy went along as a layman. He wanted to see what Final Frontiers is doing because he's been supporting our ministry for so many years now. We had a great time. There were some trials, but altogether it was a pretty easy trip, other than that they just don't know what the word sleep means in Pakistan, because I think we averaged about three hours sleep a day, and that's because several days we got no sleep at all, except all night drives in vans, which isn't really, you know, your eyes may be closed, but you're not really asleep. The main thing I want to get to you about Pakistan is this. It is a wide open field for the gospel. I did not think that since it was a Muslim nation. I thought the doors there would be like they are in many other Islamic nations, but uh, -uh it's wide open. In fact, I learned while I was there that the Pakistan flag is green and white. Green is the, is the symbolic color of Islam, and white is a symbolic color they have for other religious minorities. And to show that they have concern for minorities instead of uh, persecution for them, uh, they put those two colors on their flag. So even someone in a less than 2% of the Christian population of Pakistan can look at their flag and see that they are represented on their flag. That's not to say that there is no persecution, but generally it has to be, in their mind, provoked. You have to say something bad about the Quran or their, or Muhammad or something like that, but they're not, it's not like in other Islamic countries where they find out you're a Christian, they kill you. In fact, we learn that it's to the advantage of the Christians in Pakistan to always have a cross around their neck or on their buildings or whatever the case may be. The cross says to everybody, I'm a Christian, therefore I'm a minority, therefore you gotta be nice to me. So it's a way of advertising your faith so that you will not be persecuted. Of course, Pakistan borders India on one side and Afghanistan on the other, so it's, it's scrunched right in there. It is an Islamic nation. They're very open, however, to hearing the preaching of the gospel, whether they are Muslims or whether they are Hindu living in Pakistan. When we first got there after about a 22, 23-hour flight, uh, the pastor took us immediately to the construction site where he's building a new Bible college facility. He's been having it in his home, but really his home isn't big enough to account for it. So one of our donors, I believe in Texas, gave funds to completely build them a brand new dormitory and teaching facility. And the pastor even showed me how he's building one room onto the side, kind of like a prophet's chamber, so that when we come back, we have our own room to sleep in, our own bathroom to use, and so forth. Because during the time we were there, we stayed in the home with he and his wife, three children, and three or four college students that lived there with them and, and uh, share a space in the house. So we met a lot of the college students. Everywhere we went, we had college students with us. They'd carry our bags. Sometimes they'd carry me. Uh, they, they were just hard. It, it reminded me of my days back in Bible college where uh, we all went there to, to learn how to be preachers, to learn how to serve God. And so anytime an elderly uh, preacher would come along, we were on his, on his heels. You know, do you want something to drink? Can I get you a place to sit? Uh, sit down, tell us the stories. 
What's the most important thing you ever learned? All this. In fact, I remember one time talking to Dr. R.G. Lee. Remember him? The great, great, great preacher who's with the Lord now. I asked him once, I said, Dr. Lee, what is the last thing you do before you go to the pulpit to preach? And he looked at me and he said, son, I check my zipper. I thought that was just a incredible that that's what this great servant of God would say, but he was being practical about the ministry. And so that's what we wanted to be with these Bible college students, not fluff ourselves up as some great preacher from America, but show that as a preacher, we are a servant. We're servants to God and we're servants to them to do for them whatever they can't do for themselves. 35 years I've been doing this. 35 years scouring the globe looking for not just preachers, but excellent preachers. Not just a church planter, but men who plant multiple churches and who train their men to plant multiple churches, who train their men to plant multiple churches, and so on. Shukat is without a doubt <clears throat> the best I've ever seen. And that's why I'm doing this video for him. He needs to be helped. Now, let me say this. Everything Shukat has done in his ministry was done before we started supporting him. And it was done while he was working full time as some sort of a, a manager at a factory. His ministry was done at night. His ministry was done on the weekends when he would drive for 12 hours in a van, preach in a couple of village churches from sun up to past sundown, then drive all the way back without any sleep. That's two days without rest so that he can preach at his home church and then the next day go back to work again. When we saw what he was producing as a layman, we determined then we've got to support this man full time. Plus, we bought him a motorcycle. Uh, we paid for all of his van rental. We paid for his gasoline. We paid for the food that he has to have for he and his students to go out evangelizing. And they are tearing the woods up now. And so I wanted to share their ministry with you in hopes that you will give to our Great Commission Fund and maybe even designate it for Pakistan if you want to. But whether you do or not, a good chunk of it is going to go to Pakistan. We went to a number of churches that he has planted. I think even one that one of the men he led to Christ has planted. The people were always eager to meet us. We were able to go and share the gospel because visitors from the village would come out. I mean, basically the village empties out when we go there. They'd never seen an American. They, most of them said they'd never seen a white man. We were something for them to look at and gawk. But let me tell you this, they like Americans. They really surprised me, but they really liked Americans. So we took advantage of that, like Paul did with his Roman citizenship. But we went from church to church. The first couple of days we stayed in the city area of Lahore, visiting different churches. When I say church, I mean houses. These are all house churches. But the crowd was so big that they had us meet up on the roof of the house, and they had put up some um, like tent material around it to block the wind from coming in. But I happened to sit at the place where there was a gap in the curtain. So I was air conditioned the whole time. And we got to preach to them. They were excited. They were clapped. They enjoyed it. And then they put on a little presentation for us where they had ladies come out dressed in various tribal costumes of their country, uh, along with a dress as the men would. And it, it was just a delightful time. The final church we went to, again, was on a rooftop, and it's a church run by the students of the Bible College. And they put on a great presentation. You know, it, it almost didn't matter that you hadn't slept. It was invigorating to see all they had done, how happy they were to have us there. And everywhere we went, there was food. We had paid for that in advance, so Everywhere we went, afterwards there was food. I've never eaten, I begged, but please don't make me eat again. Oh, you have to have just a little bit. After we finished the college service that second night, instead of going to bed, we got in the van and we drove for 12 hours to the desert churches. And the first thing that caught my attention at the very first one was as we were walking down the dirt trail to get there, there were these piles of thorn bushes, uh, probably six, eight feet high, and you could barely see huts behind them. I remember that first when the Hindu village people lived on one side, then there was a canal and the Muslim people lived on the other side. There was some friction between them, um, but not like you would expect since they had a civil war over that 60 years ago. We preached to them. 
they were eager. They were from a tribe called Marari, I think is how you would pronounce it. They're from India. And that day, we came anywhere from 25 to 5 miles from the border of India. They live on both sides, but it's the same tribe. So you, you, when you talk to them, you think you're in India because of the way they dress, the way they look, the way they act. But really, they're nationally, they're Pakistanis who happen to be of that tribal group. We noticed that they had a well, but not many people were drinking from it. And that's because it doesn't go very deep and the water is not good to drink. Uh, so unless they were really, really, really thirsty, nobody was bothering with it. They used it to wash their clothes with and to bathe with. They take the buffalo manure, and as I've seen in India, they pat it down and stick it on the wall to dry. But there, they also lay it out on the ground to dry, and they ball it up into balls and put it on top of the fence, almost like a do not climb over our fence. They find it a thousand uses for it, uh, which is really amazing to observe. The women wore bracelets on both arms if they were married. That's the sign that they were married. And then they did something there that I've never seen done before. Uh, you, women are usually kind of standoffish in a Hindu perspective, but if you attempt to talk to them, they'll talk with you. These ladies, they kept their face covered like this the whole time. Um, in fact, the thing that was peculiar is when you're standing there preaching to them, they would be back over in the corner of the yard, usually kind of in a circle, and those who were facing towards us would have their faces covered. Those who were not facing may have theirs open, unless Josh walked by with a camera, then they cover them real quick. And when we had the invitation, oh my, the men instantly would stand saying that they wanted to denounce all their religion, their idols, their gods, and follow Jesus as their only Savior. It was common for the majority of men to stand up. It was incredible. And, and then when you would talk to some that would not stand, they'd say, I want to think about it more. It was never, I absolutely reject this, get out of my face, you know. You will remember a year or two ago, we asked you to help us with some money for a particular desert church that needed a well. And you gave. Boy, did you give. You'd already given money for them to have a tent constructed for a church facility, them and five or six other churches. But you gave her a well, and they sent in pictures. But pictures don't do justice as actually going there and seeing it with your own eyes. And I was, I was tickled to see what they had done. They built a baptistry. Next to it were two bathrooms, one for men and one for women, because there are no bathrooms in the village. There are no bathrooms in their homes. Tucked in a corner under that was a, a, a motor that pumps water from the well. How does a pump have the power to do it? There's no electricity there. Well, lo and behold, off to the side, they built a little, a little solar farm with six or seven solar panels. So they have solar power running the pump, which pumps the water, brings it up to the cistern, lowers it into the toilet area, into the baptistry, and then they ran PVC pipe from that supply station to every house in the village with a faucet in front of each home. So the women that were having to walk two miles to get a bucket of water now all they have to do is step out their front door and turn on a spigot. You can imagine how thrilled they are. We want to do that in five more villages. Five more villages. You say, well, is this a social program? Well, was it social when Jesus fed 5,000? If so, yeah, this is a social program. Social work should always lead towards the preaching of the gospel and conversion and the establishment of a church. And in our ministry, it does. If it doesn't, we just we find a different type of social work to do. But this church is established and strong now because of the water that we've given them, that you've given them. And we want to see that done in five more of these village churches. And it's going to cost us, we're figuring now, prices have increased since then, steel is up, cement is up, around the world, everything's up now. So we've given a budget of about $10,000 per village to do these five wells. So we're looking at $50,000. We'd like to raise, well, just as soon as we can raise it to get it over there to them. If it's something you think would be a worthwhile thing to promote the cause of Christ, to bring glory to his name, send an offering. If not, send a prayer, but be involved one way or the other. They also need schools. Now they can build their own buildings. We might need to help them with some of the rebar or something like that, but it's no problem to get bricks. 
Uh, there might be a little cost to it, but it's not like it would be in this country or even in Honduras. So there's no problem to get the bricks. The problem is just to help them with the bill. They need mortar and things like that. But the thing that impressed me the most, and I think the guys with me, it wasn't just the people, their openness and their loving spirit. Uh, it wasn't just the preachers and their zeal. It was the strategic value of, of Pakistan. The border of India where it meets is the Punjab. It's called Punjab in India. It's called Punjab in Pakistan. That is perhaps the most difficult region of India to spread the gospel in. It's probably the most persecuted area of India for spreading the gospel. But yet, just across the border, the same people, the same tribes are living there, and they are wide open to the gospel. What does that mean? If we can win them in Pakistan, we can send them into India. It's a strategic place that we've got to build up. Another issue of importance is the Taliban, we didn't go to the far north, we were advised not to, but that's where the Taliban was born. And the Taliban spread in Afghanistan, and as you know, they've conquered Afghanistan, but they're still in Pakistan. So we need to conquer that southern region for the gospel. But we also need that borderline between Afghanistan and Pakistan so that when, when necessary, we can bring our persecuted brothers into Afghanistan over into Pakistan to a safe house there. The, the believers are willing to work with us on that, to risk their lives if necessary, although I don't think it will be. But is, Pakistan is just sandwiched in there. We've got to strike while, while, it's, while it's ready to be struck. Uh, they're wide open to the gospel. In fact, I believe they said that the minister of the interior of Pakistan is a born-again Christian. It makes it public that he is. So it's a, it's a good area for it to go. Uh, it's an important area. As we drove through, we saw mustard plants growing everywhere. And you can't, as a Christian, you can't see that without thinking about the verse in the Bible about having the faith of a, of a mustard seed and how much can be accomplished. They have fields of mustard seed there. Fields and fields and thousands and thousands of acres of mustard planted. Hmm. All we got to do is put a little faith along with that, and we can see Pakistan maybe someday becoming a Christian nation. I'm, I'm sure they will someday, but in our lifetimes to see it. So I hope that what I have to say and what Josh has to show you will touch your heart and cause you to want to give to help us take better care of our brothers and sisters there and empower them uh, to go out and preach the gospel throughout their whole country. God bless you, and thank you for taking the time and having the patience to deal with my long-windedness. God bless.